Welcome to Sozo Talk Radio. Sozo Talk Radio. All right. Well, thank you for joining us at Sozo Talk Radio. My name is Daniel Lovett, and I'm with Jacob Rasmussen, uh, who is currently traveling the world. Where are you right now, Jacob? Yes. I'm in Batman, Turkey, I believe is how they pronounce it, which we would say Batman. Yeah. Wow. In Turkey. Yeah. Yes, in Turkey. And with the political climate the way that it is, at least so I've heard, uh, it's, there's a lot of tension. But here, talking with, uh, you know, the different communities, different, uh, everyone has a different cultural background. It's uh, very diverse, more so than most Western countries. And so you'll get a lot of different perspectives and opinions as you go along. But for the most part, everyone's uh, very comfortable, very um, personable, and uh, easy to get along with. Yeah. Like, uh, what, what have been some of the adventures on your journey? Like, do you, it seems like, to me, like I've heard like you've traveled a lot, like where else have you been or gone? Or Yeah. Well, um, you know, a lot is relative. I think, uh, I've definitely packed in a lot of, uh, various different places and countries. I think my experiences in the places I've been have been pretty extreme compared to, uh, maybe other travelers who have been to the same places. Um, but I have, I've been through Iceland and Germany and Cyprus, uh, India, um, a disputed part of Pakistan and India. Uh, there's kind of a conflict zone up in the um, Himalayas and uh, Turkey right now. And then, um, of course, there's other countries uh, just in this uh, trip itself that I'll be in too. Yeah. Where are you going next then? Uh, Iraq is next. Iraq. For how long? I'll be there for uh, 15 days. Wow. Yeah. So tell me, like, what, what sparked your desire to travel? What is your mission? What is your purpose in all of this? Is it more than yeah, just sightseeing? Like, like <laughs> tell our listeners. What, it is, what it is more than sightseeing for sure. Uh, and that's actually a really wonderful question that I've been asking myself um, mm-hmm. recently. I think it's something that with every new place that I go, the question arises again, why am I here? What am I doing here? Uh, I go where I feel most led. And sometimes those places are not places I ever thought I would visit. Uh, But I find myself there and um, it's incredible the way that the father leads and who he connects me with and then where I'm going next. So as far as like the ultimate goal, I personally don't have that in mind. I think if I did have it in mind, I might um, hinder the experience or hinder father's plan a little bit if I knew Mm -hmm. exactly where I was going or what I was doing next. So for me, it's, um, you know, I start off the day in always and wanting to connect with the intimately and closely. Um, don't always do that the way I'd like to, but I always make sure that it happens. And the more that I do that, uh, it's incredible the way he leads. So to answer your question a little bit more directly, I would say that for me, it's to immerse myself in experience as much as possible without having um, the objective is to not have an objective and not mm-hmm. have a personal bias for the at it through, um, you know, a scriptural perspective, but also again, not a, uh, not a religious perspective, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. A uh, spiritual perspective. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah. So, so tell me uh, some of your adventures, like, like you, okay. So first of all, where are you from? Like, I don't I don't even know some <laughs> basics about you. I know you yeah. live in California, right? Uh, no, uh, Oregon, um, above Oregon. California okay. in Oregon. All right. Yeah. Cool. Southern Oregon. I, uh, you know, born and raised in Medford, Oregon, which is about, uh, I think it's about an hour and a half from the California border. And so traveling through the Pacific Northwest was very common um, for us as a family and for me. And uh, uh, that's where I'm from, although I've been all over the place and uh, in the U.S. at least. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that I think you mentioned that you had come to Appleton. That's where I live right now. And I'm from from the Pacific Northwest. I lived, I grew up in Spokane, Washington. Okay. Okay. So I've been to... uh, 
wonder if you know where Cannon Beach is on the north. Um, yeah, yeah, north yeah, coast. yeah. Yeah, uh, that's where we uh, went as children to that. There's this Cannon Beach like Christian camp there. And I uh, remember that. Okay. I have a lot of good memories. A little park to the north of that. Good memories there. <laughs> so, but yeah, beautiful out there. Um, but you came to Appleton for like um, the Oshkosh, uh, what is it called? The uh, air show. Uh, the EAA big yeah. air show that they have there. Yeah, it's wonderful. I was a part of the EAA for a while, for a few years, and hmm. uh, I'm a pilot. So I went there and, and got some a uh, little bit more practical training and uh, introductory into uh, AMP. Um, doing uh, airframe and, and uh, power plant mechanics. Uh, That's... And I did that for the intention of just kind of getting a more general idea for my aircraft structurally, because a lot of pilots don't have that. And mm -hmm. uh, it's a good, good knowledge base to have for sure. Yeah. So you also are a pilot. Do you still currently pilot any aircraft? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't fly right now. I have to get current again. I haven't flown for, I think maybe a year and a half at least. And, that's unfortunate, but it just is what it is. And it's easy enough to, to get back into it, but uh, yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. I've been thinking about that, actually. You just have to take a medical, right? And I have to clear you, clear you that way. Uh, I, yes, I will have to take a medical again. Um, and then I'll get a check ride with a um, certified mm -hmm. uh, you know, person who, right. who checks you to make sure that you're clear to go again. Yes. Well, I was getting my pilot's license. I don't know if you knew that about me. Yeah, you said that. Yeah, yeah. you told me. Yeah, so I had gotten as far as uh, doing solo flights, you know, takeoff landing on your mm -hmm. own. I was about to uh, do my long distance trek, you know, from okay. one, airport, one airport to the next. But, cross uh, country, yeah. Yeah, cross country trip um, on your own. But it was about around that time when 9-11 happened. So um, just kind of shook up my plans in, in that way. I didn't even know hardly what I was doing with it. My, I had in the back of my head kind of like, well, to be a missionary pilot, I also considered doing like the mechanic side of things like you just mentioned. Um, uh -huh. That was just another option. thought, well, maybe I could do that. I mean, whatever. Well, right now, <laughs> if you started it up again, you're in the prime spot to, uh, to learn. I mean, there's so many amazing pilots all around uh, just people in the aviation community all around the nation, but definitely uh, over on uh, you know your side of the, the country for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if uh, that's my calling <laughs> anymore, <laughs> or or if it ever was. You know, I think I did it on a yeah. whim, uh, and uh, you know, just like, well, this is kind of what I'm thinking. I don't know. Let's just do it because I have money. <laughs> At the time, I they did. say in the aviation community, they say you either love it or you hate it. Yeah, well, I loved it um, in as far and as much as I was into it. You know, like, like if I was seriously like flying cross country for hours and hours and hours, just the concept, you know, the of the engine, and you know, I don't know if I would love it as much. I mean, I I love the physics of it and figuring out your your yeah. course and doing all of that, the math involved. That was all very interesting to me, um, um, like the wind direction compensating for that and using all these dials and things. And <laughs> uh, yeah. That was fun. I, I enjoyed that part of it. Um, I enjoyed just being up there in the air too, yeah. So especially like landing or takeoffs, you know, those are the best parts. Oh my right? goodness, that's always the funnest part of, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Navigation is fun. Like you said, doing all the compensations and doing the groundwork is actually pretty enjoyable too. But the landings and takeoffs, uh, I would say for me, landings were my favorite. Right. Um, you know, you got a crosswind. And... <laughs> yeah, I loved it so much. In fact, there was one time, uh, one of the most extreme crosswinds I was in is when I left, uh, you know, when you're training, you're only allowed to fly out even with your instructor uh, if the winds are at a certain speed. And, Mm -hmm. such and then you look out further into the uh weather advisory to see if it will pick up at all and that determines whether or not you're going to go flying uh, amongst other things and this time it looked all good and so we went out we were out maybe only a half hour or so and it picked up so strong and we just had to land and mm -hmm. uh i was training so he had me land but i was literally as i'm coming in on my final i'm looking out over his shoulder 
my instructor's shoulder down on the runway with the airplane like this. Oh my and then God. right at the last moment, I sweep around and, and, and pull it in. And it was one of the uh, better landings that I've had, but wow. it was also the most extreme. Yes, I have never had to face something like that. I mean, I, I had a little bit of crosswind and, you know, you, you just come in on like the one wheel and, you know, settles down and stuff. But yeah, it's, it is fun to, to compensate for that and, you know, makes it more interesting and whatever. But that, that sounds like a crazy mm-hmm. story. <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot yeah. of, uh, a lot of, I was a, a big um, fan of like missionary stories. And so I would, I would read all kinds of missionary books um, and about missionary pilots. And that's kind of what, what kind of fed the interest there. And, uh, yeah, it was interesting. I just met somebody else who, yeah, um, there's some epic stories with, yes, there is. Yeah. I just met somebody else who, uh, when the EAA happens and there's missionary pilots who do come into town that they host them and provide, you know, yeah. meals and stuff and potluck dinners and stuff for, for them. And, that's actually where I stayed in Appleton was with a, uh, uh, two women who owned a home and they had, I think maybe, you know, four or five bedrooms, mm-hmm. uh, well, maybe like three, four bedrooms. And so they hosted a number of different missionary pilots or former missionary pilots who, who were either in the military and then transferred to, uh, to the missionary work. Um, and so I got to meet a lot of them and just had incredible, neat people and all the stories that they had and, and, uh, just a wonderful, uh, one of the most um, homely is not the right word, but the the word that you would say for just having a solid all American um, Christian uh, family feeling to gather salt around of, the dinner yeah. table and, and salt of having the a good conversation. <laughs> yeah, it was really just incredible, and it made uh, I think it made us all feel very warm inside, and and we all uh, got a little teary eyed as we talked around the table and just was an amazing atmosphere and definitely the Holy spirit was there for sure. That's cool, man. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me what, what were your plans um, with piloting? Like what's, what's the end game there was now you you say you got into the mechanics of it, but I don't know if you told the whole story of like where, where you're going with, with your piloting. Yeah. I, um, I have to be very honest that the initial reason why I got into being a pilot, uh, although I learned to have a love for it, and I definitely like the idea of it going into it. The uh, original reason, though, I'd say 80% of the reason was out of pride. I felt like I had to create something for myself. When I did it, I think I was, when I started flying, I was like 16, um, which is, you know, pretty young to begin, but in my community that I was raised in and also with family pressures and everything else, you just feel like uh, there's a lot that you have to, there's a foundation you have to build for yourself and you got to be somebody and you got to figure out what you want to do. And then you have your family, you know, my mother's side were cops, my uh, stepfather's side were pilots and, Mm -hmm. um, or his father was a pilot. And uh, it just, there's a lot of pressure in that way. And I, I looked at either side. I thought, okay, well, if I have to do something right now, if I have to build a world for myself, I have to construct some sort of identity. What do I want to be? Do I want to be a a cop? And I thought, well, that'd be cool. I actually wouldn't mind doing that. But um, for the majority of my family, that's uh, kind of a anymore uh, looked down upon uh, law enforcement and all that. So I went, well, I guess I won't be that. And then I looked at, um, you know, becoming a pilot. And I always uh, romanticized in my mind. My uh, grandfather was a uh, chief pilot for a the first air ambulance organization, which was based in Medford. It's called Mercy Flights. And mm-hmm. his airplane that he flew and a, a little plaque about him and everything else is now in the Seattle Space Museum. Um, but he, uh, his boss kind of pioneered that whole field. And uh, so he was on the starting um, uh, end of, of a lot of that so his stories are pretty epic and, and rugged and and just amazing of uh, the kind of terrain he had to conquer with the aircraft and where he had to land to pick people up and uh, you know he's flying this old world war ii um paratrooper uh airplane that they're you know guys would jump out of and they're using that they stripped it and used it to put a gurney in and just mm-hmm. amazing the stories that he had but i i say all that because 
those stories really stuck with me. And I thought, boy, that'd be a really cool thing and kind of, you know, a neat little badge or, to put on my lapel, you know. Mm. And uh, so it was definitely a pride source um, reasoning. But once I got into it and it, I got a little overwhelmed by everything, especially with the fact that I got really honest with myself a couple of years into it and realized, you know, this isn't really what I want to do. Uh, it's just something that I felt like I had to do to, to get a name for myself. Uh, mm-hmm. And now that everyone goes, ooh, you know, Jacob is your pilot. That's cool. And the, the, <laughs> the fantastical aspect of it wore off. And then I had to say, do I really want to continue doing this? And I, I thought to myself, yes, I do. But right now it's not my priority. Mm-hmm. So then I, I let it go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. Let it go in favor of um, just starting a family and supporting my family. And then I'm realizing I didn't have the means to to do that both. You know, it's just ridiculous. I was single at the time and it was just a whatever. But yeah, as far as, uh, I don't know, I don't think any experience is wasted though. I think that's no. part of our no. our soul's journey, our soul's growth. And I would I would love to... I'd love to talk to you more about um, more about just your traveling. I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that you're in Turkey right now. Like <laughs> we're like going to Iraq yeah. for 14 more days. Um, <laughs> you know, where else have you been? Tell us. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, one of the crazier stories I've had so far, um, and one of the things that probably built up the resilience and the fearlessness to. Uh, keep going and and doing this was that while I was in India, I had some really amazing experiences. There's definitely lots of stories. I was there for uh, just about two months and met incredible people uh, all around. But there's uh, one point where I don't even know how exactly to tell the story. Um, I might have to write it down to really uh, Mm -hmm. encapsulate what had happened. But I wound up Uh, finding myself in the Himalayas uh, in Kashmir, which is the region that's disputed between China, Pakistan, and India predominantly right now. And um, they're all vying for the area because it has um, enough resources and water and, uh, well, enough natural resources to support uh, feed. And um, I think it was, I forget which resources they are, but it's, constitutes one third of all of Asia that's in there uh, with the water supply and then some minerals. And I forget what the minerals were, uh, but very vital ones for uh, doing any kind of um, infrastructure building and all that. So it was really interesting um, dispute that's going on. And depending on who you ask, there's different reasons for why it's happening. So I got in contact with uh, someone who was really good friends with the um, Uh, heads of the terrorist organization that's up there right now who's fighting off um, Pakistan, India, and China, and they're vying to build their own country, uh, which was actually in talks and in the works um, during the late 40s when everything was being divided up and the United Nations was uh, helping create the, the boundaries for every country. And then those who popped up their hand and said, hey, we're, you know, we've been trying to become our own country for a long time. And these people have been suppressing every people doing this. So there's so much of that happening. And Kashmir has been the longest disputed land area for the United Nations uh, to try and help define. And they just have been kind of um, avoiding it for a long time. So people, um, suffice it to say, have been taking it into their own hands to, um, to really push back against all these different military forces who have uh, come in and tried to, to trample over um, their land and people. And, and uh, really abuse uh, both. And so really interesting to uh, get their perspective. I was actually happened to be one of the only people uh, that's been able to interview now or don't have anybody, especially through the mainstream organization to speak with them uh, because they know how much um, they push a specific narrative and have already an idea in mind of, of uh, what they want to do with the story and because I didn't and because I was working freelance and said hey I'm just building a story and I'll do it from uh, as completely unbiased as possible and because I really don't know a lot about uh, what this is I'll um, I'll learn as much as I can from every side and and compilate a 
a story that is um, as truthful, as honest, and as realistic from all perspectives as possible. And they're actually really on board with that. So they're really excited to, to have me there. Uh, the issue came when uh, after about two weeks, the main lead was um, wanting to get in touch with, who is a Yassin Malik is his name. And he kept getting incarcerated every time that we were uh, about to get in contact. And so we almost didn't eat. However, I got very, um, I got a brain parasite while I was there. And so I began to deteriorate really quickly. And I was down and out. I couldn't even move from my bed uh, for almost two weeks. Uh, actually, I think it was a full two weeks while I was in Kashmir. And because I was in an area that uh, I didn't really have the ability, I had access to Wi-Fi seldomly, uh, but they cut off the um, internet and, and electricity and everything else for the, for the people, for the military use um, periodically throughout the day and throughout the weeks and whatnot. So I didn't have it all the time. And then they don't allow you to get a SIM card there if you're a foreigner. And even those who are locals uh, have a hard time sometimes getting uh, any kind of device for communication. So I had a hard time communicating with other people. And the language barrier was such that they really got uh, pretty frustrated with me that I was just, to them, hanging out uh, in my room and not doing anything for them. And they didn't understand or grasp the fact that I felt like I was about to die. And um, I couldn't really communicate the nuances of, of how I was feeling to them. So I, they, uh, one day as I'm packing up to leave, I finally got enough energy within me to, to leave. And I had to, I just, I couldn't. I exacerbated the funding that I had for the trip as well as uh, my energy level was just such that I, I couldn't continue. So uh, I was packing up to leave and I had just enough money to buy myself a plane ticket back. Uh, hang out for a little while with a doctor that I met in India and then leave um, the country and they came into my room and demanded that I give them all of my money uh, and so they they took me down uh, maybe maybe like a half hour 45 minutes into town down this little back alley in a corner and uh, there's like five of the guys there and you know they got their leather black jackets on and they're He's saying, that, you know, you're going to pay me this money. And, and they asked some crazy, crazy fee. Uh, and I was like, there's not even a way I have that in my, <laughs> my bank account. And so they just took my, uh, my debit card and swiped it until they got the uh, amount of money that they could from it. And um, that was, they got, you know, pretty much everything that was on my card at that point. So I didn't have any money. I had the equivalent of like 98 cents, you know, in my pocket uh, in rupees. And I got to a bus station a local there who had heard my story helped me get to a bus station got me on the bus um, as I'm on the bus uh, these couple of guys who were traveling from Goa they're um, from down south in India heard my story and they were freaking out that I was even there they're like no we don't even go here we die if we go here we're crazy for even being in this region we're just you know passing through and you're insane for being here and, and so they're like oh we'll, we'll help you out and they didn't really know English that much either but just enough to you know comprehend what I was telling them. And so they bought me, uh, you know, the equivalent of like maybe $3.50 to get a train ticket as far as I could south, uh, just as enough money that they had on them and helped me out. It was an amazing uh, blessing. And I had happened to, while I was on the train, it was like a day and a half journey, I think, um, total. I think it was about a day and a half journey. And I remember the train station this is a little dinky little train station out in the middle of absolutely nowhere where this doctor was that i met who's indian and a couple of his assistants one day said hey you want to go for a walk we'll go to the train station uh you know through google translate they're telling me this and I, uh, why in the world are we going to a train this is such a random place to go to and it's so out of the blue you know out of the way you know of this area and it was like a you know 30 minute walk from and down these little streets and corners and such. But I happened to remember and recall in my mind, because it was such a peculiar place to go, uh, I happened to recall them taking me there. And so in my mind, like from a month previous, I'm going, okay, I, rem I think I remember how to get here. And uh, uh, happened to see, I saw, we stopped at a, a train station and I looked down, and went, oh, this is that town. So I jumped off there and then walked down these little streets and finally found his office. He wasn't there, but I, 
walked in and the assistants were there, Jacob, and weren't expecting to see me. I, I plopped down on the couch and fell asleep and then was woken up by the doctor, you know, shaking me awake, like, Jacob, why are you, you know, what are you doing here? So wow. that was, uh, that's kind of the fun, adventurous, really condensed version of the adventure that I had while I was there amongst many others. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Not sure. Okay. Yeah. We're having a, just, just had a glitch on the video feed, but that's an amazing story and God saw you through it all. You know, um, I don't think we've really specified for our listeners, the fact that you're, you're a Christian, you know, um, I would love to hear your faith story. How did you come to faith in Jesus Christ? What does that relationship mean to you? Um, yeah, we'll start with that. Hopefully this doesn't freeze up, <laughs> which it just seemed to. Did you catch all that? I caught most of it. I, that okay. you, you were specifying for your listeners that I'm a Christian and something else. Yeah, and just wanted to hear your your story of how you came to faith in Christ and just what he means to okay. you. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say as far as you know, coming to Christ, it wasn't anything that was uh, a big slap in the face, you know, as, as I think a lot of people who, who even grew up in a Christian community, grew up in a Christian home, they usually have that uh, moment where they really connect with the Father in that way. I think that there's been lots of those instances and that for me, it just continues on through my life. I think really for everybody that happens, it's not, you know, maybe someone can recall one instance where it was maybe the biggest impact for them, but the creator still continues to impact us through our lives in such a way that, that renew and rebuild and strengthen our relationship with him. Um, so I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up very fundamental Baptist and, you know, I wouldn't uh, relate. I wouldn't, relate with a lot of the same doctrine, but I do appreciate and regard the principles that I learned from it uh, very much. And mm -hmm. that's what's carried with me through everything that I've done and uh, everything that I've learned. I mean, I've been through, I've, I've, you know, the creators navigated me through so many various different religions and spiritual perspectives. And that foundation has always carried with me. Uh, and I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, so I definitely, you know, uh, say, yes, I am a Christian, however, not in a totally conventional sense. I think that there's a lot of other influences that the Father has allowed me to have in order to build a foundation to be able to communicate with other people from different cultures and ethnicities really well and understand different perspectives without immediately, you know, maybe judging them uh, mm -hmm. as much as, as one might if they didn't have those other outside influences. Um, to uh, listen to and hear and, and understand. So um, for me, coming to the faith that I have now is a continual process. It's not something that happened once and, and uh, you know, it was like, boom, I'm done. Okay, that's it. I think that the Father definitely has, has led me and continues to and, and, and unravels day by day, moment by moment, um, his purpose and plan for me. Yeah, and even through all the highs and lows, like getting kept, kidnapped and robbed and... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That whole process. But um, I hear you when you say, uh, you know, about influences from other religions. I too have sought to relate to and to be able to speak into their lives, like the New Age uh, culture. I've studied like a little bit about Buddhism and stuff. And then mm -hmm. the truth is, I mean, it's not like it's not like they don't have some truth. I mean, there's, there's right. a lot of truth everywhere, you know, and uh, sure they have a lot. I mean, of course, ultimately though, as the Bible reveals, Jesus is the truth. He's the, the Mr. Truth himself. Like I am the way, the truth and the life, you know, and uh, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And uh, I was meditating on that scripture the other day. And for me, it's a, it's a continual journey in like, um, getting to know him better, uh, him challenging me on like, well, how well do you want to know me? How much are you into this, Daniel? Cause I'm all in. How much are you into this? And, like, yeah. Constant, yeah. the constant challenge there. And then like testing you, showing your heart. And then you're like, Ooh, I don't like that part. And then you kind of back off from the relationship for a while or whatever. And 
you know, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, for me, it's, it's all about this relationship with, with Jesus mm-hmm. and with, uh, with Mr. Truth himself. And, and um, yeah. I forget the theologian, but I saw um, a man giving a, a sermon a while back is actually, you know, just a little clip on Facebook. And he was saying that um, the way that we relate to the creator in our minds or the, how we perceive him is how we perceive the life around us is basically in essence what he was saying. It's so true. And you were speaking to something about that too, uh, in that, you know, the creator is all in, he's totally there with us all the time. He says, he'll never leave us or forsake us. And what's interesting about that though, is that we tend to, at least I say we, as in, um, my background and with the community that I've, uh, grown up with known and affiliated with for a long time, uh, there tends to be a general idea and what's been implanted in me too is that, that the creator uh, helps us along until we do something that's uh, that's a little against um, maybe the the uh, pure theology of of uh, how we ought to believe in him or think of him and then he'll walk away from us and just kind of discard us for a while and say well when you figure it out you can come back to me and uh, so we live in this fear that we might do something wrong uh, following the creator and so we kind of confine ourselves to not be able to open our our boxes up a little bit and um, go beyond the boundaries that we've set for ourselves because they're kind of safety barriers so that we don't um, you know spiral out of control I think we we're too afraid of uh, what lay beyond um, the initial doctrine that we learn that we don't explore we don't uh, seek the creator outside of it and um, and then we create all these uh, very valid, good seeming reasons uh, for s- keeping our confinement. And they totally are good and valid if that's what you wish to do. But I think that there's, uh, for those who, who really want to um, traverse and, and uh, explore the unknown and, and go to the final frontiers of, uh, of the universe and what the creator has for us, there's a lot to learn. Yes, indeed. I, I concur. You know, um, a lot to learn. Um, for me, I, I was just, as you were talking, I was thinking about this verse. Um, it says, Christ is all and in all. Um, you know, that, that we all came from the creator. We all came from Jesus, you know, that all things were made by him and for him. And that he is multifaceted. I mean, there's, I mean, just think of the variety and, and creation and just all the animals he thought up and, um, you know, and, and just how we're fearfully and wonderfully made as humans. Like um, he regulates our body temperature. And I, I, I've been sick recently. And it's funny because uh, when I'm this sickness, I, I drink something with ice in it. And all of a sudden my bones are chilled and I'm shivering. And then I drink something hot and then I'm, I'm sweating. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm just thankful for like God. Normally, you know, when you're not sick, he regulates all that so perfectly and, and, uh-huh. and your body and. And just what a masterpiece we are, what a work of art. And we, we, we think such low, uh, sad thoughts all the time, just like we're, we're missing yeah. the, the fullness of the magic of what, what reality really is. And just, um, our identity, our identity as sons of God, you know, I was thinking about that verse about all creation groans for the revelation, the revealing of the sons of God. You know, and daughters for all the ladies who are listening. You know. But yes. yeah, um, that it's suppressed right now from what it could be and should be. Um, well, while what? What are, we, what are we doing in this process? Are we figuring out our, our identity? You know, uh, well, some people are. <laughs> but, well, um, yeah, and I think definitely a lot of people who um, seek to find their identity unfortunately will cling to um you know the typical things are usually your your job or your relationship or uh, your family or or what's um, prevalent around you uh and that can honestly very very i say this very boldly but also um very in a raw sense it, it can be religion too we can define ourselves by our religious beliefs and that's kind of what i was speaking to earlier yeah uh, is that we define ourselves by um some theology just because our pastor when we were five years old and our parents told us 
uh, you know, what to believe and how to believe it. And uh, because we went to that one church and, and learned from that one pastor who probably, you know, the, the truth that he spoke isn't, it's not that it was wrong or bad or anything. It's just that um, we chose to believe that that was the uh, only truth that there was or only um, interpretation or only way to view uh, that. And so it, it makes our relatability with others um, very limited and it creates a finite box for us to, to um, operate in. I know I said that before, but I really, I, I'm infusing that into, I'm segueing that into a lot of the reason why I like to travel so much is because it bursts those boxes for me. It totally bursts those bubbles in a yeah. lot of ways. Um, yeah. it, it makes me either, I have to, uh, to go along with it or go home, basically. And I have yeah. to allow the creator to work or I'm just going to walk away. And there's definitely been a few times where I've been um, confronted and I've never felt like, oh, I totally want to leave. But I have thought, like, do I want to continue with this? And I thought, you know what? He has me on a path for a reason. And maybe I, uh, you know, can just let go of this uh, particular idea or, or um, reasoning or belief and just um, allow myself to understand this perspective a little bit more. And that doesn't mean I have to take it on either. I think that's the biggest fear is people think that if they open themselves up to another perspective, that means that they have to leave the other truth that they've known for so long and take on this new uh, identity because we identify ourselves too much with our thought processes, with um, our, our beliefs and our, yeah. our thinking. And we don't identify with the creator who is um, all encompassing and, and yeah. uh, really can teach anybody from any perspective in any way and walk in life. He can, he can show us who he is. And uh, to see that from, from someone else's perspective is really important. And I think we get bogged down and controlled so much by our fears um, mm -hmm. of each other, fears of uh, some phantom group out there in the ether that might come after us, like, uh, you know, the government. I mean, if you, if you think about <laughs> what the government encompasses, that can be literally, I mean, it could be so much. It could be just about anything. Uh, that's corporate. And um, it's just amazing how much, you know, people say and use the word the government and automatically we get the groans of like, oh yeah, no, no, no. but then what is the government? It's like saying the devil. Well, what, who's, who's the devil and how do you know that he cares about you so much that he's really after you right now? Cause he's not uh, like the creator in the fact that he's, uh, you know, uh, omniscient and always uh, there with you. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be a pretty special individual for the, for the devil to be after mm -hmm. you specifically. So I think that sometimes it's just, um, you know, uh, uh, what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes we're confronted with uh, what doesn't work in an unpleasant way. And, and we take that a little bit too personally, a little bit too seriously. And rather than just a learning experience, we take it as a, a personal attack by the devil. And so we're now, uh, you know, scared of this boogeyman that's out there. Uh, rather than just uh, taking responsibility for the actions that we've uh, made and saying, you know what, maybe this doesn't work and I'll try something different next time. Right. Right. That's a very pragmatic, you know, pragmatic approach of like what, <laughs> what works, you know, this, this uh, relationship with, with Jesus should work. And really what, what, what's the core of it? Love. I just learned a song. Uh, it's a, a song called nature boy and and the whole the, the point of the song the end of the song it, it says the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and to be loved in return and you know when i read in first john where it says those who live in love live in god and god in them that applies to anyone even if their thinking is skewed about who they you know their belief system it's not our belief system that saves us it's jesus and uh and my Bible says right. that a person who loves is connected to God, whose name is love. You know, that God is love. That that's, that's his name, his essence, right? You yeah, really yeah. think about it. You really think about it. So you're in Muslim, Muslim territory. I think that a Muslim that you meet who is more grounded in love would stand a far better chance before the judge of all the earth than, than a Baptist who's full of judgment and hate. Right. 
yeah the, that's you know that's a bold thing to say for sure definitely as as a christian i uh i have those those thoughts and beliefs and i do my best to try and communicate that i do a lot of uh i'm very prolific with my writing and i enjoy to be able to have a diplomatic approach to um to those sorts of discussions and conversations yeah um because i think you totally hit the nail on the head for sure for me i look at love as also being one and same with honor um I think that honor and respect often get blurred. The lines get blurred. However, those are two very, very different things. Uh, I believe that honor is something that you give simply because you are and, and it is, whereas respect is something that can be taken and given and, um, and lost very easily and then also given very easily without uh, and change too. It changes throughout your relationship with an individual. So you might respect somebody for doing something. You're like, oh, I really respect Donald Trump. And then you look at something that he's done in his past and go, oh, that bastard. And then you're like, well, now wait a second. Why did you respect him for that? And then all of a sudden he lost his respect now. And you're not going to trust anything he does from this point on. And I'm just using him as an example um, mm -hmm. because uh, politics is really easy to use as an example for something yeah. like that. But well, um, just to, you know, with anything, uh, even our brothers in Christ, if you say that you disrespect some or, or they, you lack respect for somebody simply because they, they, uh, faltered in, um, in whatever way we believe to be best or right. And that, uh, you know, maybe he'll come back to the, to the fold of God at some point. And who are we to be the judges of, uh, of what they did and how would we appreciate being in a similar position if they were? Uh, if we did something similar, if we were doing what they were doing, uh, would we really want our relationship with the creator to be like the relationship we have with them right now? And I think that that's really important, too, because that speaks to a lot of um, I know this is really like jumping in pretty far, but like a, a very uh, narcissistic tendency. I think we have in, in um, Christianity that has plagued us for a long time, at least mm -hmm. in the last few hundred years, for sure. Yes, and I, I love what you said about honor because the, as the, the Bible says, to honor all men. You know, and I was talking to a pastor about that one time and I said, well, uh, so do you honor so-and-so? You know, and I, I mentioned somebody he viewed as a false teacher. Do you honor them? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, <laughs> really. <Yeah. laughs> you know, um, but the Bible says honor all men. How do we how do we dig for the gold? How do we how do we treat others with honor? Creating an, a culture of honor. My my church is actually big on that, um, and they I think they they're following kind of the model that's being set at Bethel Church, you know, with, uh, okay. with Chris Ballatin and um, Bill Johnson, you know, uh, creating just a culture of honor. It's not like we worship people, but we honor them. That brings out their best too. It brings out my best when I when I get honored, when I get respected at my concerts, for instance, when they're with me and you know, <laughs> you know, lending their energy to the thing instead of just like crickets are chirping after every song. Like, oh, did you even like that? I don't know. You know, <laughs> a couple of songs. I did a concert today at a nursing home, and a couple of songs kind of fell flat. <laughs> it's like, oh, I guess that didn't yeah. work very well. <laughs> But, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, honoring, um, honoring people brings out their best and, um, and it brings change too towards love, right? Cause they're drawn to that. It's, it's, it is a way to love, you know, people. Yeah, it is them. love. I definitely yeah. believe it is love. You know, it, it might not be uh, every faucet of love that we can, um, we can express and, uh, but yeah. it doesn't, it, in essence, it really encompasses a lot. Yeah. Even, even the fear of the Lord is to honor him right yeah uh, that's that's like reverential trust is one way i've i've heard it expressed about the fear of the lord uh, mm -hmm. which I, I really like that um description uh, um but reverential trust to honor him as our creator as hey he first of all he is no one to be trifled with you start uh you start taking advantage of of his kindness and his you know, loving kindness, he might just give you a spanking and it's not going to be pleasant, you know, like he did to Miriam when Miriam challenged Moses. I'm, I'm reading through the Bible right now in 90 days. So I'm like into Deuteronomy. Yeah, I, yeah I've seen that challenge. Yeah. Um, but like to Miriam, she challenged Moses and, and 
God gave her leprosy for seven days. Like, go outside the camp. You're leprous for seven days, you know, because she was uh, she was not honoring Moses, she, <laughs> you know. So, yeah. And uh, another thing that I just to get on this ninety days through the Bible thing. Um, another thing I've been thinking a lot about is like, you know, um, ethnic cleansing. Like you, you look at you look at some of this mm. stuff, and you you have to you have to trust God, um, and, and not stand in the place of judge over God. And I think the tendency for most modern readers would to stand in judgment over God in these matters. When Jesus said, you know, when the Lord says, God, you know, Jesus and God, they're one, right? So this is Jesus would say this, you know, go and kill the Amalekites, every man, woman, and child, you know slaughter them all and we try to do pr for god but we have to trust okay he knows better maybe i mean all these amalekites they're like sacrificing their babies to demons to gain special favors they're offering their women mm-hmm. to demons to create these nephilim you know the anakim you know all this uh, right sense all this stuff and you have to trust okay i trust you jesus because your love and for the good of the world and for the future of the world this needed to happen and the full measure of the sin of the Amorites and all the Canaanites had come into effect. God put it off for 400 years and just gave them mercy and a chance to whatever repent and Mm -hmm. change their ways. But they didn't, they just persisted in that until it's like, okay, after 400 years, I mean, God's super merciful and long suffering with us. And he always, he always, I don't know. I trust his reason reasoning behind that. I don't stand in a position of judging God on those things not just doing PR for um, God either. I think that people can go the other way too and become judgmental toward other ethnicities who we believe, you know, we take the scripture, at least from an uh, English translation perspective is pretty vague on what idols are on what uh, um, these temples were that they uh, had to go through and destroy because then there's, some kings through kings that, uh, you know, you read through kings and it talks about uh, how the creator loves some of them, but even though they, and then it, it makes a point of saying, but they still didn't tear down the, the uh, places of worship. Um, mm-hmm. However, it seems to be kind of varying in between, uh, you know, stories, like sometimes create, it says that, uh, and, and the father, you know, uh, didn't like him for that or other ones it says and they and he loved him even though he didn't do this so it's kind of you wonder like well okay what in today's vernacular are those idols are those places of worship are those um specific Hmm. uh ways in which they were worshiping god that was inappropriate incorrect and not um biblical because there's a lot of ways in which if you look at uh if you really understand the culture and um perspectives and way of worshiping at that time uh if we really understood what they were doing the israelites were doing culturally uh, that the creator appreciated and loved it would look like blasphemy to us today and so you kind of wonder in today's vernacular and how we look at uh, worship how do we even know it's been a question for me is how do we even know what appropriate worship is supposed to look like if if there's been through so much you know like even um, even Jewish worship, how do we know that the Jewish worship of today is even uh, in a, you know even remotely similar to the same you know because for instance, it's like uh, geographically, um, if you look at Israel, geographically Israel is very different than it has been throughout you know the last thousands of years. Egypt is very different than it has been the, the terrain is is uh, very different in uh, what they conquered, what they owned. And so when the Bible talks about Egypt, it does, and it talks about Israel in the Middle East, it definitely gives specific places that we know today. But then we've also learned through history that uh, when the Romans went through and, and pioneered and pillaged, and when the um, Crusaders went through and said, hey, where is this location? Where is this? Where is this? In order not to die and in order to make some money, the Jews who were living there at the time or just the people that were living there at the time went, I don't know, how about that rock over there? And now they're discovering that, oh, actually, it's not that rock that they've now created this big, you know, they, they've created a city and called it this place. And, and now they've created this big tourist attraction. We actually found out that it was 100 miles west of that area or, you know, whatever it is. And you're like, well, 
how crazy is that you know so you kind of wonder religiously too is that is what we look at passover to be today is that really the same as what passover has been uh you know for thousands of years or has it um maybe shifted and changed i'm just using passover as an example i'm not actually trying to pick that apart i'm just saying that in general you know let's say like uh christmas or easter or any of these uh, common holidays that we tend to uh, give reverence to god uh, on does he really care does it matter to him is it something that uh, he really wishes us to do where do you see it in the past how do you see it being performed in the past must we uh, utilize the same uh, methods of, of uh, doing things that they used to or the same kind of traditions do we have to incorporate that into our daily practice today all those different questions i think are um, are ones that i've had for a long time for sure yeah well, I'll tell you, one of the scriptures that came to mind as you're, you're, you're talking about that was where it says the father, uh, the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. The father mm-hmm. desires, you know, this and uh, that it's, that it's by and through the Holy Spirit. And like, like, I think he's made it easy. Um, it's not anything to do with ritual. It's just sincerity and like a real relationship. It's real conversation. It's you and God being friends, you know, and I love this. I love the scripture in Romans 511. I share this all the time with people because it just, it's my favorite verse in the Bible, really. You know, where it says, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. So we're, we're, we're friends with God. That's, that's what Jesus has made true for you, Jacob, for me, for anybody watching this. That's true for everybody. He's made you friends. What are you going to do with it? Do you want, do you want it, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely the perspective I I seem to come back to uh, all the time. Whenever I ask those questions for myself, whenever I ask them to the creator and just, uh, you know, a lot of questions I I realize are answered by creator, not like in a moment through prayer, but I'll, I'll pray about it and then I'll just remain open about it all. I'll, not forget about it, but just let it go. And then throughout the day, maybe even just an hour later, that question will totally be answered and come together and I'll, I'll write about it or, or just uh, internalize it in some way. Uh, or it may just be through like uh, my journey as I'm traveling for the next week, all different aspects of that question will be uncovered for me. And I'll be like, oh man, that's crazy with whatever the question is. For that one though, I just have, have asked because... Um, I brought that into the conversation for two reasons. One is, of course, I'm traveling through uh, a lot of um, um, Muslim uh, territory. And it's just very interesting. Our view as as Christians are to, for the most part, it's, I don't know that we would actively say that we hate Muslims, but it's that we uh, do have a little bit of animosity toward um who they are, what they're doing. Uh, and a lot of that comes, I think, from either just like blatant disinformation or uh, comes from a lack of understanding of the culture and perspective and, and background for them. Because also here, sure, there are definitely Muslims who don't appreciate or don't um, uh, respect Christians, don't honor uh, what we're doing and, and uh, our perspectives and think that we're total idiots. For sure, you'll, you'll find those people. Uh, likewise, you'll find that in Christianity too, or any other religion against any other religion. Uh, I, I wrote something a while back that basically said every religion has a God hater of another religion. And I think that's one of our faults in identifying with um, religion and with, like you said, our belief sets are not what's going to save us. It's creator. It's that's mm-hmm. going to bind and knit us together. Who's going to uh, really bring about the love within us to share with others too. Mm-hmm. And so when we're defining ourselves and, and um, if we're confining God into our belief sets in order to push a certain agenda that we feel self-righteous about, that, that is, that is uh, for some reason, we've built this, uh, you know, high tower and uh, pedestal that we've put mm-hmm. um, just different belief sets upon in order to be able to, uh, to hate and, and control other people. Uh, because we believe that what they're doing is wrong. I think that that is the ultimate ma- manipulation of uh, the word of God by, by uh, Satan, if you will, uh, mm-hmm. than, yeah. than has really ever been done before, is the control well, and, and fear and hatred of other people. 
And I do believe that the enemy and the whole kingdom of darkness, if you will, um, they make it a point to study scriptures as to how they can distort and use it against people. I mean, they know the Bible way better than any of us, um, you know, and um, yeah, it can be used as a, as a weapon. Of course, it was in, during Jesus' temptation. and uh, It's been used against me, you know, for years. It's actually uh, kind of why I plunged into depression for seven years was because of scripture. I just would open scripture and just, it would always just condemn me, condemn, condemn, yeah. condemn until it just drove yeah. me away and into darkness, you know, into my golem cave, <laughs> you know, and it's not like I was a particularly evil person. It's just like, they just had me convinced. Um, I, you know, I've been through a lot of probably what you've been through with like the religious judgments and expectations and condemnations and, and the, the way you see God, like, okay, you screw up. Uh, he's pretty pissed at you, you know, and he'll, sh he'll shelve you. And yeah. uh, you have to, you have to be really an outstanding person, like somebody like Joshua or Caleb or to, to make his A-list to even, you know, somebody that he doesn't want to kill, right. you know? <laughs> you, you yeah, these, exactly. Right. You get these ideas and you're like, wait a minute. Um, no, God is love. Okay. And, and they, people didn't always know that, or I don't know we are prone to evil just like the bible says like like jesus says how you then though you are evil know how to good give good gifts to your children how much more will the father give the holy spirit the best gift mm -hmm. when you ask for for it you know um and it's so interesting oh sorry go ahead yeah it's it's just uh that the like like he says right after genesis like okay um your thoughts and your intentions of your heart are continually evil from birth. Like, like we have such a, a poor understanding, I think, of just love. And, you know, we live in this, this I don't know, like a, 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 lo like a loveless world by and large. I mean, you'll see it here and there, and it's, it's wonderful. But, but, yeah, we need to embrace that and to uh, find that somehow, you know? Find the love. Yeah. I think, you know, I think I think your video froze. <laughs> All right, maybe it'll come back. Are you there? Yeah. Oh, I'm there back. you are. Okay. <laughs> Good. Did you? Was my audio working, or was it uh, no. also frozen? Yeah, it's frozen. Okay. Every, everything for about thirty seconds or less. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah, this is an interesting discussion. I'm. We're gonna have to get together again and do another talk or something. Yeah, I'd love it yeah. for sure. But uh, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll just. Ended about now, and uh, I don't know. You you mentioned your writings. This is what I kind of want to highlight um, in closing. Is like, do you have a blog that you do? Or I what? don't. It's something that um, I'll put together soon. I I want to do that, but uh, most of my writings, because I do photography and I do creative writing, okay. uh, so I do you know in combination would be photojournalism. And That'd be great. I'll post things on uh, Instagram is a really great portfolio for that for a lot of various different photographers and journalists. So most of that content goes on there for the photography and writing about travel. And also I do uh, short little videos and clips of uh, what I'm doing, explaining, um, you know, religious perspectives, uh, cultural yeah. perspectives and political ones too, uh, as I go throughout and just my different experiences um, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. All right. So what is your Instagram? handle if you if you know it offhand uh if you type in jacob space michael um i should come up uh you know might have to scroll down a little bit otherwise it's the illustrative journal all one word the illustrative journal at instagram yeah. okay um jacob and then michael. uh facebook is where i post uh, most of uh, my um spiritual writings okay and, and where can we find you? Is there, do you have a certain page or something or do we have to 
Can I uh, the Illustrative there? Journal is also on uh, Facebook. Um, okay. However, the posting isn't as prolific as it is on Instagram. Right. And if you're looking for the spiritual content, mostly it's just on my personal page, which is uh, Jacob Rasmussen. Yeah. R-A-S-M-U-S-S-E-N. Well, that's cool. I have uh, relations here um, with the same last name. Oh. Ras- Rasmussen. Okay. So, um, and of course you are related, but perhaps just as much as I am. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. it's actually, I never was adopted into the Rasmussen family. So really I'm either a Kerfi or a La Flesh. Okay. Um, but uh, Rasmussen is just the name I've gone by for a long time since it was my stepfather's and, and yeah. uh, I've known him most of my life. So, Yeah, that's great. Um, all right. So are you on YouTube? You know what? I need to be. I, I yes, haven't uh, haven't jumped into that yet, but I'll I'll do that. Right. It's a good idea. Yeah. Well, I'd love to help you out in whatever way I can, in just uh, blogging tips or video. You know, definitely YouTube sure. Whatever yeah. Else. Whatever else. I'm yeah, we'll talk to, about that. Excited to hear more about your travels. Go have an adventure. <laughs> Not All too, right. Yeah. Too dangerous. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of fun. I think danger is pretty relative to where you are. I think some people like, you know, they'll tell me, I'll get messages like, oh, I'm, you know, praying for you to stay, stay safe. Or, or they'll ask, are you safe over there? And I'll think, well, safe is relative because, you know, safe in Medford, Oregon is, um, is, is no, is anybody looking at you funny, you know, or uh, over here, it's like, are, have you, have you been tortured yet? Like, has, has that happened to you? Are you safe still? So mm-hmm. it's, it's totally relative. It's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, this interview and I'm going to let you get thank some you. sleep and I'm going to have dinner and uh, all this stuff. So, okay. God bless you and your travels. We'll talk again sometime. Yeah. Bless you too. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.